Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Zan, and I uh, work at Pusher, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, library development. So, uh, yeah, Nick invited me, and uh, I invited Jim and Will. <laughs> um, thanks for that. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, <clears throat> so I used to be an Android developer uh, for a very long time, uh, mostly building apps, and uh, recently I started doing uh, libraries as well. So I mentioned that I work at Pusher. So what we do is uh, we build tools for developers uh, for adding real-time capabilities uh, in their uh, applications. Mm. We also have a couple of really cool products that, uh, that uh, I want to talk about. Is one, one is sessions. So what we do is we record meetups around UK, around Europe, and uh, we uh, we post them online, sync the slides, uh, do, do the transcripts as well, so that you have a meetup that's kind of recorded and uh, conference as well. So we do that service. Uh, you should check it out. They got some awesome, uh, really good technical content there. Uh, we also mentioned the, the blog, which is making.pusher.com, which is our engineering blog, which uh, is where we post uh, content like uh, your where, where your talk came from essentially so uh, about uh, Golang's Golang's garbage collector yeah and there is that's weird uh, okay I think it's fun now anyway not here to talk about that I think it's the because that one was on anyway yeah so I'm gonna talk about libraries um, mobile libraries in particular, but uh, most of that is kind of can be applied to general libraries and SDKs. So how the talk is structured, I'm going to talk about uh, firstly uh, what are the, what libraries are, why do we build them, why they're in, important and uh, different kind of differentiators we can we can have uh, when we're building them. And then we'll follow uh, the design and development process for libraries. Uh, in this nice waterfall -y fashion. So start with design, <laughs> then development, and uh, we're gonna throw it on to testing. And uh, finally, we need to release it, and uh, we also need to support it, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, we're gonna be talking about some documentation stuff as well. Okay, so why would you be interested in building libraries in the first place? So maybe you're building apps and uh, maybe you want to share some functionality so uh, we all know that uh, copying code is uh, bad and frowned upon so we kind of abstract that to one place package in the library and you can just share it between different apps uh, that's a very good uh, option another one is uh, maybe we built something that has a cool feature uh, called cool functionality like a logging framework or a networking uh, API or something like that. And we just want to give it to everyone else to, to kind of use. So we're nice people we want to share and we want uh, free labor out of it. So uh, it looks good on the GitHub profile. It's easier to make them apps. So that's another one. And uh, yeah, what we do at Pusher is we make libraries that are backed by commercial service. So we do it for money as well. Love and money, great. Um, yeah, by definition, this is my definition, not anyone else's. Uh, they're basically a collection of classes and methods that encapsulate some common shared functionality. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, this can be applied to any, any other library. Main difference between apps is uh, they're not end products. Users will not see or use a library directly. They use them through the apps and uh, there is this, interesting uh, power ratio between apps and libraries. So an app can have multiple libraries. A library can have uh, multiple app, can support multiple apps. Well, should support multiple apps if, because that's the purpose. Otherwise, we're just having one code that's just supporting one app and the sharing bit isn't really coming into effect. So yeah, you may hear uh, words like frameworks, SDKs as well alongside libraries. Uh, essentially, they're the same thing. Uh, in iOS, 
they, they're usually called frameworks. Uh, in Android and Java, they're usually called libraries. And sometimes, like Facebook, for instance, Twitter, they, they also talk about SDKs, but they're kind of the same thing. They, they have one job, they do that job, and we include them in our apps. Mm. They come in different shapes and sizes, so they can be either uh, general, so I can use an Android library as a Java library on server side and, 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 and client side, or maybe it's, it's a pure UI kind of thing, so that's then kind of specific to Android. And maybe they're not even living in our app, maybe they're like, uh, testing, uh, something, something that allows us to test better. So Mojito or uh, any other testing framework would fall into that group as well. Most of the stuff we include, again, is public, publicly accessible, free and open source software. But that's by no means all of it. So a lot of companies do internal tools that uh, will have kind of internal, uh, <clears throat> internal not public libraries, so um, it kind of makes sense if you have some shared functionality, some kind of authentication that's common to your company or uh, bits and pieces. That's when you would kind of publish them, but privately so that not everyone can access it. And yeah, some of them are free, some of them are commercial. Uh, there's very big uh, difference. And yeah, obviously the API also how they look like, how they feel like, how, how we include them, that's also different from on a case-by-case -case basis. And yeah, all developers are products. Uh, all, all libraries are products, sorry. Uh, and um, as opposed to apps, our products are not being used by users. They're, they're being used, the users are developers. So uh, this is good because uh, we are all developers. We speak programming languages. Uh, we're kind of the same, uh, but that's not quite true because like more often than not, you see if you're building libraries, you kind of anticipate that everyone will share the same mindset, will share the same kind of uh, skills than you, but that's by far not the case. So what, yeah. Um, what happens is people come from front end to do mobile, people come from mobile to do back end, and uh, if that happens, usually you don't know what the hell you're doing. Um, and as a library developer, we wanna kind of cater for that demographic as well. And uh, the we call that, instead of user experience, we call that developer experience as the developer is the user. But yeah, there is one common thing to all developers, and that's it, we're all lazy. We wouldn't be in this business if we weren't lazy. We wanna do less things, we, we wanna build things so we can do less things, so we can be slack off more, essentially. Um, and that's an important job of libraries. If they don't enable us to be lazy, if they don't enable us to do less work, then why would I use that? It makes no sense to me. That's kinda, how it's all about. So moving on, um, we got to design it, right? And uh, we usually design user interfaces and because uh, libraries don't have user interfaces and the developer is our user, then the API takes the role of a user interface when it comes to that. Um, so um, this is where people will interact with our, with our, with our software. Uh, how they would uh, first see it, uh, where they will kind of uh, enter it and use it. So it's probably the most important thing about our libs, essentially. And considering a library, if it's good, will do one job, do it well. So the API should enable us to do that with as, as much, as easy as possible, essentially. Um, but it's not just one big thing, so there is like quite a lot of things when it comes to uh, talking about APIs. So we gotta we gotta instantiate it. So we gotta come into it essentially. Uh, I call these entry points. Then we probably have some methods and some data to throw around. So that's interaction points and data model. 
and uh, not everything goes as planned. So we need to know what to do and how to do, how to how to behave when things don't go as planned. So this this is all about exceptions and errors and uh, and uh, good messaging. So entry points allow us to configure the library. And uh, a lot of libs, they, they share quite a lot of, I mean, they, they are, they're easy to, to start with, but they sometimes come with a lot of kind of little fiddly configuration options. Um, and uh, if you think about it, our pusher libs, they, I mean, you can instantiate them with what, two lines of code, but you can extend that to like, have 10 more parameters. And a lot of them are like that. In Swift, that's fine. Why is that? Because in Swift, you can, you can have a constructor that has named parameters. You can, have a, you can have optional. So you can actually just specify, OK, you need these two. You need, uh, uh, I think, the app key and uh, something else. But if you want the custom cluster, if you want, the, if you want some other switches, you want to you can you you can specify them, but they're not necessary. Whereas in Java, if you if you if you come across like constructors that have three, four, five, or more uh, arguments, it's it doesn't work. So <laughs> that's why we kind of we can use the builder pattern here because it's uh, it makes our Java look more like a modern programming language like Swift, for instance. Uh, thirdly, yeah, some, some of them are like UI components, so in Android we include them in XML, so I included this as well. But I'm going to talk about builders a little bit because that's going to, a way to make Java, which is an old language, modern again, at least. So, uh, yeah, it, um, it, it kind of, mitigates the shortcomings of Java. What we can do is uh, we can have a class called builder that's essentially got methods for setting different things to it. So uh, setter method for each individual uh, configuration option that we set. So uh, instead of one big constructor, we have five, seven methods. May most of them would be optional. But the important ones uh, would essentially validate its inputs before they actually go get to the constructor. So the builder is kind of sanitizing all the inputs and preparing the constructor so that our main classes can, can be uh, a lot tidier. <clears throat> um, that's essentially a job. So uh, that's kind of it. So we're in. We, we can use it. Uh, and. Uh, when designing the APIs for how to how to how to use your library, it's probably going to be dependent on what whatever you're building. So, if you're building something with networking, or if you're building something for logging or for authentication, it's going to differ a lot because the domain is so different that uh, it makes no sense to kind of um, to kind of cover everything in here. So, but there are some common points here. There's still solid principles to be followed. So Uncle Bob in his book, Clean Code, and other books that are more than, what, 10, 15 years old, uh, they're really good. And they kind of, he talks about that stuff a lot. So how to, how, what, what, how to name things correctly, how to uh, structure your code that it's, that it's kind of nice to use, and how to build your interfaces. But essentially, if your users come with come from a particular background, so they come from uh, Java or Swift or or GoLang or or C plus plus backgrounds, they will expect certain certain paradigms to be kind of followed. So that's important because you want your library to be as as intuitive as possible. So don't surprise your users. Uh, give them what they expect because that's what they like because they don't want to. They're too lazy to learn about new things, usually. Um, but you can always do go one or two step, uh, steps uh, forward to kind of bring something to them that's a bit extra. So 
what I, I like to um, mention a library called Retrofit here because uh, that's like one of the most delightful libraries to use. It's by Square and it's a network, network library for uh, actually a HTTP client library for uh, for Android and Java. And essentially it combines annotations and interfaces so that you kind of define your RESTful API in, in one giant interface or small interface. And it kind of builds everything you need with limited configuration. And it just, when you use it, it's just magical. So that's kind of the delightful part of it. Another thing we can include in our libs to make the API nicer is uh, some Rx functionality. It's quite popular lately, so we got Rx wrappers for pretty much every language out there, even PHP. And what that is, is uh, like it's a better, it's an upgrade from the old way of doing async, which is callbacks, calling other callbacks, calling other callbacks, and uh, generally creating this mess of spaghetti. So uh, instead, you present your code as a series of events. <clears throat> and then you can use, uh, actually, as a stream of events. And then you can use functional operators on this stream of events. So if I receive this network, uh, uh, network response, and it's in particular, uh, it contains a particular error, I can actually handle this in, in one stream, or I can, I can follow the, the success stream and do the follow-up requests. And the code generally becomes a lot neater. But it's not, it's not uh, that common. Not everyone uses it. So I still think it's, it's, more, it's more of a power user feature. So uh, um, thread lightly. It's, I think, personally think that it's better to kind of still stick to callbacks and this, and have Rx as a delightful bit on top of it. So, so if if someone wants it, let them have it, but don't kind of kind of push it to them directly because most users or most developers are not gonna uh, use it, likely. And yeah, not everything happens as as we want it. And there is one important distinction between apps and libs. So when apps, with apps, when we develop them, we don't want the users to see any, any, anything that's wrong. So we want to hide the crashes. We want to we pretend that nothing's wrong. Everything is rosy. That's why Facebook app doesn't crash. It just goes to this white screen and then just restarts itself. And the user thinks, oh, I, I did something wrong. No, app crashed because it's shit. Um, um, so yeah. When it comes to libs, we actually want them to crash. We want, we want to give the developers as much data as possible to kind of uh, avoid these crashes in their app code. So yeah, crash early, crash often, and uh, make sure that error messaging is, is, is really good. What uh, a good technique uh, you can follow is essentially if, if there is a common issue that people can um, fall into, so you can actually add a link to your error message. So if there is a configuration mishap or something like that that usually happens, you can just have a website and link to it. And people will see it in an error message. And then they can actually, uh, you, can, you can show a lot more data in it than in just one small line of code that's hidden in the log files. Um, and yeah, some APIs make sense to be, I mean, maybe it makes sense for, for, for you to have some APIs that are more domain specific. So <clears throat> that's why you can also consider building a DSL. Like Rx Java, Rx in general is a DSL for doing a stream operations on events. Um, and another example would be Hemcrest. It's, it's a testing and test assertion library, which makes any odd language really nice and fluid. So we can use like modern techniques like annotations in Java to generate our code to kind of make it uh, a lot uh, nicer and more fit for the use case. 
or you can use techniques in, in Swift, like operate and overloading or uh, extension functions to kind of build your API so it's more uh, so it's more domain specific. If that makes sense to you, I mean it's it's kind of a thin line to walk here. Mm. But yeah, we got our API. We got to develop it now. Um, the good thing about this is there isn't there isn't any new new things here. The only things we need to kind of worry or or follow is um, essentially libraries do come with some costs. So every every method that's in the library is going to go into the app uh, unless people use obfuscation and people no, normally don't. And uh, so. The bigger the library, the bigger the app. The bigger the app, the longer the compile times. The longer the compile times, the more pissed off the developers. So uh, yeah, dependencies, if your library brings in something that it doesn't really need, that's affecting the build time, it's affecting the library size, so you don't want that. And obviously, avoid stupid shit like memory leaks because uh, that's kind of, no one likes them. And especially if they're out of your control, that's, uh, that's like the worst thing. Yeah. Essentially, I think it's better to to have a hit on the niceness of the of the implementation if in favor of the API niceness. So we should really kind of strive for making the API as nice and clean as possible, but when it comes to implementation we can we can make some ugly code. Why is that? Because we're going to test it. And uh, yeah, libraries need, st need tests because they're used by a lot more people in a lot more cases that we don't anticipate. Easy thing here is uh, if they're pure Java or Swift or whatever, we just unit test the whole thing. So they run fast. We can run. We can write a lot of them, and uh, they're cheap to make and cheap to maintain. But it not. It doesn't always work like that. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we touch a lot more than what only unit tests can can uh, handle. So if we touch like uh, underlying OS, if especially if there's like some. Um, vendor implementations that can uh, that can uh, affect our performance uh, then we may want to build like a companion app that we have to write integration tests for and that by extension then tests our library i think this is like a very kind of advanced topic we, we did one for uh, jim built one for uh, our push notification uh, service and uh, that's kind of more of an edge case, but sometimes it makes sense. But the smart thing to do is essentially, if you have a library, if you have a service, use it yourself. Because if you use it yourself, then you're going to be the user. You're going to see, you're going to be the implementer as well. So you're going to see all the issues that can possibly stem from it. Mm. My friend David uh, Schreiber Runner, uh, he made a talk about. Uh, how they test PS PDF kit, which is a PDF framework for iOS, Android, web. And they essentially do that. They essentially build an app that includes, basically they build the best PDF uh, reader out there for, for mobiles because they wanted to test their library. And uh, yeah. And obviously there is another thing we can't do when we're test, uh, when we're, um, writing our libs. We can't really get any data from the users. Because if we put any Google Analytics or any similar tracking code in there, people would just say, what the hell is this? Why is this library calling the service that I don't want to be called? Uh, so you can't really track anything. Unless you have a service, in which case you can kind of, you can kind of send some library specific headers or or some data that kind of allows you to tell you allows you to know what where it's coming from how it's being used but that's kind of very uh 
again, an edge case. Best thing we can do is kind of listen to our users, uh, follow support channels, uh, and figure out how people are using it so that we know uh, we know what kind of usage patterns to expect. And yeah, dog fooding again saves the day here because if we have an app that uses our lib, then we can easily put as much uh, tracking and analytics around it. So that's good. Next up, we've developed it. We want to ship it. Um, everything that we ship needs a version. So there isn't really any other way to do this but semantic versioning. So if you're already doing this, that's fine. If not, you should. Uh, essentially, semantic version means uh, splitting your version into three parts, separated by dots or periods. Uh, major meaning breaking API changes. Uh, so one or two dots something is going to have major Im impact on, on how your uh, app interacts with the lib. Whereas minor means we've added the feature. Everything should still work. There shouldn't be any changes required to your to your app, but you can use these new features. And uh, you shouldn't really use the patch number because uh, you should test your shit. Um, but yeah, if, that, if, 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 if bugs happen, then you should update the patch number. Uh, so this is why, why Node.js will never reach the version above zero, basically, because it just breaks all the time. Um, yeah, so uh, this is how not to do releasing. So uh, don't expect people to include your library uh, binaries in your project because that's that's unmaintainable and don't expect people to include your library as a git submodule we did both at mns and it was a bad idea so you shouldn't do that what you should do is you should obviously use the built-in package managers uh, cocopods carthage or swift pm but i don't think swift pm works on uh, on uh, on xcode projects yet so Carthage and CocoaPods are, are pretty cool for, for iOS and Android and Java have Maven Central, J Center, and also Jetpack, which is quite similar to in the way it works to uh, Carthage and CocoaPods. It kind of works on top of uh, your existing Git repository. Mm. There's also obviously private options. So both uh, Carthage and CocoaPods, they work off private repos as well, uh, as long as they have a way to access it, um, like your, your SSH key or a token or something like that. Mm. In Java, Maven, companies that are behind Maven Central, JCenter, they have their own uh, commercial software. There is also Artifactory, which is open source version of JCenter, and uh, you can also host it on like services like S3. Uh, or any other buckets that allow you to, to store blobs, essentially, for private cases anyway. <coughs> but yeah, we've released, we've shipped, but we need to make sure that people know how to use it. And uh, there is really a lot of options here. So it, it ranges from very simple quick start uh, examples to elaborate wiki documentation that's uh, that's the has like 20, 30 pages. Essentially, depending on your use case, depending on the complexity that you're talking about, that's how much you want to uh, document and what you want to document with. Honor mentioned here to tests, because tests, if, if, if they cover your features, they cover the way you, 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 sh you should use your features. So tests are also legit and uh, very valuable as a living source of uh, documentation. <clears throat> But yeah, most important one is probably quick start, because essentially it allows us to be lazy and uh, just copy paste these three lines of code, and uh, it's gonna magically include uh, this library in our app, which is cool. Everyone likes that, and everyone wanna. I mean, you can just show that uh, to someone and just say, "Hey, this is really easy to to integrate," and uh, people are more likely to kind of use it if it's simpler to quick start. Another one also very cheap to do is uh, sample apps. You probably have it already in some way if you've kind of manually tested your library. 
So you might have some apps to kind of probably live alongside your library in the repo and just uh, and just uh, just showcase the basic and maybe even more advanced features because you can do you can do all sorts of things if you can if you can have like little apps that kind of do do a one particular thing and uh, it shows the integration a lot nicer in a lot nicer way last but not least uh, you can get the machine to generate your uh, your libraries for you which is nice uh, essentially these are really cheap to make you just say okay this is my method it takes these parameters and uh, you run a script and it's automatically generated for you in HTML documentation usually that you can just host it alongside your other docs or it's even available uh, in your IDEs so I really like to press like command space and uh, see the suggestions see what it all it's all about so that's pretty cool as well but essentially if libraries uh, allow app developers to be lazy docs mean having good docs mean having really good like we don't have to support it that much. So as library developers, we don't want to spend our time on support. So let the docs handle it. Let's be lazy as developers. Yeah, so we kind of covered the whole life cycle and uh, from API design has to be nice to development. As long as API is nice, we can, we can make a performant code in there and uh, make sure it's also tested to releasing, use semantic versioning to, and uh, use package managers. There is no alternative. And to how important the docs are. So we've kind of covered these things. So that was me. Thank you. Good Nick? Question. So you mentioned maybe putting links to documentation in your error messages. What about, you go one step further, what about you take the stack trace, you push it through the search engine of stack overflow, <laughs> and then you return the error message, which is the stack trace plus the link on stack overflow where somebody can find the fix. What about <coughs> I think that's an idea someone could make money from. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a really cool idea. Um, I mean, all sorts of truth comes from Stack Overflow anyway, so that's completely legit. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on open sourcing internal tools and libraries? Do you think there's any benefits on developing your internal tools and libraries as if you were to make them publicly available? Yeah, so if, if what's the benefit of open sourcing uh, developer tools and libraries or developing them as if you were going to open source them? So I think you pay more attention to the quality and the documentation if you plan to open source something just because if strangers are going to look at my code, I, wanna, I want that code to be really nice, then... Uh, if you know that only you and your close colleagues are going to look at it, then you're probably cutting corners in important places like documentation. So you would definitely improve your quality a little bit, just um, subconsciously, if you, win, if you want. Uh, again, like most open source products started off as uh, internal tooling. So that's another, another way to look at it. Because if you build some internal tooling and... Uh, you want more people to look at it, to comment on it. It's just, it's just a good thing to kind of open source it. And if you've, if you've covered your bases by uh, making sure the documentation, the quality is high enough that you would kind of trust it with other people, then I don't see why not. Hold on. Thank you.